Committee will come back to order, and we'll now hear from our second panel. Uh, includes Ms. Linda Ziegler, uh, who is the Senior Vice President for Customer Services at Southern California Edison. Ms. Denise Gray, who is the Director for Hybrid Energy Storage Systems at General Motors. Mary Ann Wright is the Vice President and General Manager for Hybrid Systems Power Solutions at Johnson. You'll each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing, and when all three of you have completed your testimony, we'll begin with questions, and each member will have five minutes to question the panel. Ms. Ziegler, we will begin with you. Could you, could you turn on your mic? Thank you. Advanced battery technology. Um, at Southern California Edison, we are the largest purchaser of wind. We purchase over 2,700 megawatts, and we also purchase 90 percent of the solar generation in the country. My company has been committed to the electrification of transportation for 20 years. We operate the nation's largest and most successful fleet of electric vehicles, a fleet that has traveled nearly 15 million miles on electric power. Our electric vehicle technical center, unique in the utility industry, is one of only several facilities recognized by the Department of Energy to evaluate all forms of electric drive technology. We have ongoing research collaborations with major automakers, battery suppliers, and both the federal and state governments. We believe that with continued engineering advances and appropriate public policy support, the widespread use of advanced batteries in plug-in vehicles and in stationary storage applications will become one of the nation's most effective strategies in the broader effort to address energy security, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and reduce air pollutants. In fact, the Electric Power Research Institute, which we heard from earlier, and the Natural Resources Defense Council recently partnered to publish one of the most comprehensive studies to date on plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. One key finding was that widespread adoption of plug-in hybrids could reduce annual emissions of greenhouse gases by more than 450 million metric tons by 2050, or the equivalent of removing 82 million passenger cars from the road. That kind of reduction is obviously a long way off, but it provides all the more incentive for us to begin today. Electricity is virtually petroleum-free is about 25 to 50 percent the cost of a gallon of gasoline equivalent and is the only alternative transportation fuel today with the national infrastructure already in place. A recent study by the U.S. Department of Energy estimates that a little over 70 percent of light-duty cars and trucks on the road today could be fueled by the excess off-peak capacity that exists in the electricity system without building a single new power plant. For utilities such as Southern California Edison, the challenge and opportunity is to integrate electric transportation and their advanced batteries into a total energy system. In the near term, the advanced high energy battery in a plug-in vehicle could serve as a source of temporary emergency power for the home or to occasionally help customers avoid high electricity costs during peak pricing times. We call this vehicle to home. These same advanced high-energy batteries could also be used in stationary applications. Homeowners could fill a home energy battery at night using low-cost electricity and then draw from it during the high-cost part of the day to help lower their monthly utility bill. In the midterm, as plug-in vehicles increase in volume, using the grid's off-peak capacity at night to charge these vehicles may actually help lower customers' rates by increasing the utilization of our generating pants. In effect, utilities would spread their fixed cost over more kilowatt-hour sales. To evaluate new business models on these and other applications, Edison recently launched a partnership with Ford Motor Company to demonstrate and evaluate purpose-built plug-in hybrid Ford Escapes. Our goal is to explore the future customer values delivered through plug-in vehicles and stationary energy storage. At the same time as the emergence of plug-in vehicles and home energy storage is the advent of advanced utility meters. Over the next five years, Southern California Edison will install five million next-generation advanced meters called Edison Smart Connect in the home of every customer in our service territory. These meters will offer our customers better information and enhance control over their electricity usage. Our electric vehicle technical center is working with industry stakeholders to integrate the vehicles and the home and the advanced meter. 
finally, in the long term, we can imagine the potential of so-called vehicle-to-grid systems or the ability to move stored energy from many plug-in vehicles back to the grid. The potential, however, of vehicle-to-grid is many years away and will depend on the development of all new control technologies as part of the smart grid of the future. Is that anything I should worry about? <laughs> um, okay. Now let me conclude with our view on the important role the federal government can play to bring the promise of electric transportation closer to reality. In our opinion, large-scale domestic manufacturing capacity for high-energy advanced batteries is critical to the expansion of plug-in hybrid vehicle applications and complementary stationary energy <laughs> storage uses. There currently exists no such capacity on a significant scale in the United States today. The federal government should provide near-term incentives to help nurture U.S. production of this critical technology. And earlier this year, H.R. 670, the DRIVE Act, included important measures to support research, development, and demonstration of advanced batteries in plug-in hybrids, battery EVs, and stationary applications, as well as R&D for other aspects of electro-drive technology. This language was then improved this summer by battery makers, automakers, and other stakeholders, and has now passed the Senate as H.R. 6, and parts of the DRIVE Act have passed the House as H.R. 3221. We support this language and look forward to working with your committee to explore other effective national manufacturing and consumer incentives to set the stage for the breakthrough of plug-in vehicles and energy storage in the U.S. marketplace. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, we stand committed to partnering with all automakers, battery suppliers, stakeholders, and government to help realize the vision I have laid out for you today. Thank you very much. You're welcome, and thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, those were our equivalent in the Science Committee of bells uh, for votes. Uh, so uh, we will have votes in just a, in just a few minutes. Uh, we'll proceed on until we have to leave, and we'll be watching the number of people for those votes. So at this time, we'll call on Ms. Gray for five minutes. Of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of General Motors. I am Denise Gray, Director of the Hybrid Energy Storage Systems Department. I direct the development and the production of energy storage systems for GM with a focus on developing and qualifying new battery technology solutions. For 100 years, the global automotive industry has run almost exclusively in oil. Tomorrow's industry will not. The solution, alternative sources of energy, along with new technology to allow automobiles to run on tomorrow's fuels, but what fuels and what technology. At GM, we believe that no one solution is right for every part of the world or even every co consumer in, every, in any given market. So our approach is simple. Offer as many choices as possible to as many consumers as possible everywhere we do business while offering the best possible fuel economy for whatever type of vehicle our customers choose. Our vision moving forward is to reduce petroleum dependency and greenhouse gas emissions by displacing oil with biofuels and electricity, as well as enhancing vehicle efficiencies. And we have developed a comprehensive advanced propulsion strategy to meet these challenges. We're continuing to make in incremental improvements in the efficiency of conventional vehicles. We're continuing to expand the portfolio of flex fuel vehicles, ramping up to 50 percent by 2012 provided the fuel infrastructure and supplies are available. We're continuing to expand the portfolio of hybrid vehicles that we offer with five hybrid model models available this year and more coming next year. Most relevant to this hearing, we have started a plug-in program for our Saturn View Green Line two-mode hybrid, followed by the introduction of our Chevrolet Volt concept vehicle. And finally, we continue, we are continuing to develop hydrogen-powered fuel cell vehicles and the infrastructure needed to support such vehicles, with the largest market test of fuel cell vehicles to date beginning later this month. As I mentioned earlier, this year brought the announcement of the game-changing Chevy Volt, our first demonstration of an innovative new GM propulsion system called eFlex. The E stands for electric because all the eFlex vehicles will run on electricity. The, the flex in E-Flex e is flexible because the electricity can come from many different sources. 
GM's eFlex system is simpler than hybrids because it's purely electrically driven. Electricity is stored in the battery pack and used with electric motors to drive the, to drive the car with the electricity from the battery obtained in two different ways. First, you can plug in your vehicle and your common electrical outlet to recharge the battery. This allows the vehicle to operate as a battery electric vehicle. Second, once the battery charge from the electric utility grid is depleted, the battery can also be recharged by a simple engine generator set or fuel cells. This allows you to extend your vehicle's electric driving range to several hundred miles. Let me turn to our battery technologies. There are really two types of batteries that we require. The one most people are familiar with is charged depletion. Think of this as a flashlight that depletes its energy when used. And then you can either dispose of it or you can recharge it. It is the rechargeable version of this battery that we are most interested in for plug-in hybrids. This is a new idea, that, and this is a new area of focus for the US ABC. The other type of battery is known as charge sustaining. These batteries are designed to accept and deliver power while maintaining a constant state of charge. They never deplete. Charge sustaining batteries are used in hybrids on the roads today, such as, such as our Saturn Aura hybrid. They store up energy captured during braking and reapply it to help the vehicle accelerate. Charge sustaining batteries have progressed to the point where many OEMs are able to offer these hybrid vehicles. We owe much of this success to the work of DOE and USABC with the supplier community. For plug-in vehicles, we, are really, we really need, which, which we need, really need are high energy charge depletion batteries that also has power, so we're looking for both of those attributes. To bring these new energy hybrid batteries to market, GM is using a multi-phase process which starts with qualifying these lithium ion cells. Then we develop these, we, test, we go through a number of different tests as a battery pack uh, with, with performance attributes such as life, um, durability, reliability, and finally we work through our vehicle integration process to make sure that these batteries can live in our vehicle, in our vehicles. As this work as necessary uh, as a precursor to a solution, implementation ready, and planning into our production programs. Again, I must um, make sure that with these points in mind, we have to follow the various concepts, if you will, that, that are outlined in our various, our various plans. Again, with this, I stop and look forward to your questions. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Ms. Gray. Ms. Wright, you're recognized for five minutes, and, and at the conclusion of that, we do have three votes uh, and uh, we'll be in recess uh, long enough for us to make those votes, probably half an hour. Uh. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, it's a pleasure to be here. And my hope is when we all walk out of this room for you to go vote, that you'll have a better understanding of what the state of play is for battery technology and how we're applying that battery technology into the various hybrid applications. Um, before joining Johnson Controls, I was with Ford most of my career where I was the chief engineer of the Escape Hybrid. And Mr. Inglis, I was also the uh, chief engineer for the fuel cell program and the hydrogen internal combustion engine program. Um, so I'm going to do two things today. One is, what is the state of play of hybrid battery technology? And what's going on relative to putting that technology into the vehicles? Um, as Denise said, on the road today, we have a lot of hybrids. Um, they're powered by nickel metal hydride uh, batteries. And I have to tell you, as an industry, we've done a really good job of creating acceptance and confidence in the technology. They're reliable, they perform well, they're safe, and they deliver really good fuel economy and lower emissions. <clears throat> but like anybody's technology, your iPod or anything else, te technology continues to move forward. Now what we're doing is you're seeing this journey go on from nickel metal hydride to lithium ion. And it's, it's the right step. They're smaller, they're more powerful, they're lighter, they're equally safe. And the expectation, obviously, is the economic benefits are going to come along with them as well. And along with all those benefits, you get better fuel economy, better emissions performance because they're lighter. Weight is the evil in a vehicle for fuel economy. Now, not all hybrids are alike. At the break, we had an interesting discussion, and one of the things I want everybody to understand is there are several different types of hybrids. We have hybrids that are on the road today, readily uh, available for all of us to purchase and drive. Uh, Mr. Bartlett drives his Prius, I have an Escape. 
Starting with the stuff that's here today, we have micro hybrids. Those are basic start stop function hybrids. They're widely available in Europe. In fact, Johnson Controls will put over 400,000 of these batteries in vehicles this year over in Europe. And they, and they have a pretty good um, efficiency rating of about 10 percent fuel economy and CO2 reduction benefits. Moving up the spectrum, we have mild hybrids. That you would probably think of as a Honda Accord. Uh, delivers about 30 percent improved fuel economy and emissions and provides a bit more functionality, as Denise said, regenerative capability. And then finally, we have the full hybrids. Um, and an escape hybrid, a Toyota Prius, or a full hybrid. You can propel the vehicle on electric power alone, which clearly would provide increased uh, economy relative to fuel consumption as well as reducing CO2 emissions. All of these are on the road and available today. In fact, uh, Johnson Controls next year will be putting our first lithium ion batteries in the Mercedes S Class, which will go on sale in the United States in 2009. And they also are uh, ready to go into the full hybrid. You take the journey a bit further, now we're talking about plug ins and pure EVs. And there's an awful lot of deservedly so, excitement about the opportunity with plug-ins. Um, they're very promising, significantly improved fuel economy and emissions. I mean, literally you can have zero emissions and, and very, very high uh, fuel economy ratings. <coughs> Lithium ion clearly is the enabler just because of the physics of the battery. They're smaller and lighter because of all the energy that's going to be required to be able to propel these vehicles. Just as the lithium ions the enabler, it's also the biggest technical challenge that we have on the table. And it's working with my customers such as Denise to try and overcome these challenges as an as industry. <clears throat> now in Johnson Controls we have a lot of partnerships um, in play right now with GM on the Saturn View. Uh, with Southern Cal, with Ford Motor Company on a plug-in fleet, and clearly all the great work that's going on with USABC, as well as the Chrysler Sprinter vans that are going on sale next year. We're going to solve these technical problems. I'm absolutely convinced of that because I sat in this seat about four years ago talking about hybrids and just getting them on the road. But then what you're faced with is what are you going to do about the cost and the, the economics? We got to get the scale up. We have to get standards. We have to put a recycling infrastructure in place. We need domestic manufacturing capability. We have to establish a diverse supply base outside of Asia. So in conclusion, this we are confident we're going to be able to get to commercialization by solving the technology and working towards these cost drivers but it's going to take federal government assistance. We're going to need to continue to fund research, and not for just the stuff that we're doing today. Clearly we need that. We need demonstration fleets. We also need to fund the next great breakthrough, because just like lithium ion was a breakthrough, next is going to be something else. Um, the, the consumer and manufacturing incentives are, are sure enablers to help us with this. Uh, funding manufacturing investment and in infrastructure and supply-based de development. We have to facilitate collaboration between the industry, our federal la or our government labs, the automakers and the utilities to see this all come to fruition in a way that we can see mass commercialization. So in summary, recognizing that you all need to go and vote, thank you very much and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. We will stand in recess for our votes. See you shortly. <laughs>